and welcome to our public works presentation on our school improvement plan presentation. May we please face the flag and recite the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Roll call. Trustee Miller. Present. Trustee Candelaria. Present. Trustee Zulno. Present. Trustee King. We're here. And Trustee Mamala is also present. And the superintendent of schools, let the record reflect, all five trustees are present. And the superintendent of schools. Item two, school improvement plans. Superintendent Miller. Good evening, everyone. Good evening to those watching online. If you're not familiar, um, what we're going to be going over tonight are the school improvement plans uh, for the district and for each of our uh, 19 schools. Uh, each principal, you'll hear from each building leader as they come up and talk about their goal. Um, unique this year is the district set three goals that we then put down at each of the building level. So our district leaders are going to come up first and discuss the evolution of those district goals and then we'll begin to hear from the buildings after that. Um, so whomever would like to begin, I believe it's Mrs. Danko. Good evening, Board of School Trustees, Superintendent Miller, President Mamala. We are very excited to present our school improvement plans tonight. We are excited to have three cohesive district improvement goals and also school level improvement goals. We would like to set some of the process and expectation protocols for the evening before we begin so that we're all on the same page. Each school will have five minutes to present their individual school goal. We have 20 school presentations, and we respectfully ask that all questions kindly be submitted via email to Mr. Miller, just so we can keep things moving this evening. Mm -hmm. I will begin with our first district level goal. By the spring of 2023, we will see a 50% decrease in the number of community complaints related to culturally insensitive practices as measured by the SCH complaint process documentation. As part of this goal, we have measurable objectives for two years. It will take two years to get 100% of our SCH staff trained in professional development focused on cultural responsiveness. Our goal for the first year is 50% of the staff, and by the second year, 100% of the staff. That is our first district goal. Mr. Salinas. Good evening, Superintendent Miller, President Mamala, trustees, and community. And so I am going to talk today about goal number two. And so by the spring of 2023, 100% of School City of Hammond schools will implement an effective MTSS in place to meet a student's needs academically, behaviorally, and social emotional needs, as evidenced by the documentation of committee meetings and student data. Just to be clear, uh, MTSS stands for Multi-Tiered System of Supports, and SEL refers to Social Emotional Learning. So this is a wraparound uh, program where students' emotional and academic needs will all be met under the umbrella of the multi-tiered system of services that we provide here in the School City of Hammond. Our first year, by the spring of 2021, 100% of district and building level administrators will receive professional development in the MTSS framework. And uh, our measurable objective by year two, in the spring of 2022, 100% of certified and classified staff will receive professional development in the School City of Hammond MTSS framework as developed by our district team. So once again, our goal is to have 100% of our um, staff trained by the spring of 2023. And next will be Dr. Yanders with our goal number three. Good evening. I'm going to present to you our goal number three. By the spring of 2023, we will see a 10% increase in students' growth 
and proficiency uh, levels on language arts and math state level assessments. And we also have a two-year plan which we want to work towards. And that first year is reviewing the baseline of data from this school year from our formative and summative assessments to create our baseline. Then by uh, year 2022, we will see a 5% increase in students' proficiency and making that 10% by the year 2023. And this will involve a lot of professional development, which will focus on the differentiation of instruction to address the various needs of our students. With that, be said, with that being said, we're going to start with our first school. I'd like to introduce but, to you. But before we go on, I'm sorry to interrupt, guys. Could, could um, Catherine, could you maybe talk just for a moment about how these goals were developed? Sure. <laughs> yeah, just, I, just to give you a point of reference, not to put you off guard, but you recall we, where the title had us set some goals in the summer, maybe start with that, and how this conversation evolved into the three district goals that we have. And anybody else jump in, Tony and Leslie as well. Right, so this summer, as part of the consolidated application for all the federal grants, um, we were charged with looking at district level data and information to come up with district goals. And so we started there. We jumped in this summer. We developed district goals. And as we were talking about the school improvement plans, sometimes when you write goals, um, they're not broken down necessarily into SMART goals with measurable outcomes. So we had to take those district goals and really break them down to what they would look like in the schools and what our needs were in the schools. So since then, we've worked on the district goals in that application, we've worked on district goals here, and then as I've been writing the federal grant applications, I've been applying those same goals to the funding to, to fund initiatives that help us meet those goals. So the idea is that we're completely streamlining all of mm -hmm. our process, processes. And with that being said, so using the data, uh, as she was doing the application. So we also took a look at the data and noticed that there were commonalities among all the schools. So we're, we are working toward, as a district, consistency and um, alignment. And with that being said, instead of us having 5,000 different school improvement plans for each school, look at those areas, common areas of concern and try to simplify that whole process and coming up with three strong areas that we can hit and make improvements across the district at the same time. And that also is going to help us out with streamlining that funding because now we've realized, and this is a known fact, that you get more out of companies when you're bringing in um, services and you're, you, you're purchasing all type of supplies, the more you can buy and the more services that you can get to help the less, you know, the lower the price. So those are some things that we also consider. So uh, one of the other things, trustees, that you may have heard in the presentations are, <clears throat> this is a three-year plan. And I feel strongly, being in School City for a long time, that a lot of times we have really good initiatives, but we don't actually give them the time and the resources and the support to actually see them through so they have an impact on the culture of what we're doing. In something like cultural competency, that's not a one-year thing and done. Like That's something that's going to take some time to change the culture of School City of Hammond to be responsive in that kind of way. It's something that not in one year, but in three years, I think, yes, we can have measurable goals and improvement. MTSS, if you're not familiar, this is looking at how do we support students um, as a whole, comprehensively, not just looking at, okay, they're failing in academics, so we have to have an academic solution to help that student achieve. Recognizing that many times there's a behavior cause that is tied directly to the academic performance where there's a social emotional gap that's, that's expressing itself in academic or behavioral performance. So realizing all those things and having those tied together is what MTSS is all about. And, and we've, we've had some minor gains with that, but really dedicating for the next three years to make sure that happens in all of our buildings at the level that it needs to with fidelity is, is what we need. And the last part of improving core instruction through differentiation, that's going to meet the, the needs of our learners wherever they're at. We know one of our realities is the kids come to us many times grade levels behind, and they're coming from out of state, and we, we just have to accept them where they're at. 
if our teachers have better training in differentiation, we can meet them where they're at and help them to, to overcome some of those gaps. But again, that's not something that, that just happens in one year. That's the kind of investment that, that we're making over the next three years are these three goals. Cultural competency, MTSS, and improving core instruction. And I think those are three things that will have measurable results for all of School City of Hammond uh, when we get there three years from now. And, and that's the plan. Well, thank you. So once again, with that being said, I'd like to uh, bring up Mrs. Lauren Dato from the Area Career Center. Good evening, Superintendent, President Mamala, Board of Trustees. I am presenting our unique number four goal for the Hammond Area Career Center. Our demographics are as listed. We have very low enrollment this year at 480 related to COVID. We didn't have a virtual option. We believe that CTE needs to be done in person. We're about equal between males and females. Um, our highest demographic is Hispanic or Latino. And we don't have data on exceptional learners, gifted. So we're looking into that. We have about 56 special education students and 15 English language learners. And as of today, we have 127 students that qualify for free and reduced meals. But our sending schools have to report that information to us. So if they don't let us know that their students are receiving free or reduced meals, we don't know until they get our bill. And then they say, well, we don't want to pay this. We're free lunch. And then that's how we get most of our data on that. Our goal is that by the close of the 2021 academic year, our placement rate will increase by 10% as measured by the Perkins guidelines, standards, or regulations. This means that the percentage of CTE concentrators in our building, because that's who we're tracking, that's who this improvement plan is for, in the second quarter after exiting from us are in either college or trade school, Ivy Tech, a community program, or advanced training, military service, a Title I service program or have a job. And we track that, that placement, so that we can have good outcomes. We need to know our student outcomes. And right now, our placement percentage is 44%. We have some roles and responsibilities. We have a work-based learning coordinator, and he goes out and he networks with all of the industry in the area, trying to acquire internships and graduation opportunities once our students are out of school. We have a career counselor who ensures that students are headed down the path they're going. And if it's school that they are looking to get into after the ACC, she makes that happen. We have a dual credit and certification coordinator and she ensures students receive credentials or dual credits so that those credits can apply to their post-secondary education or those credentials can apply to their employment. The faculty and staff will all be supporting students and making sure that they're ready for whatever their next step is. And the administration's job is to monitor those responsibilities and provide support. Our strategies to achieve this are we need to collect accurate student demographic data. Sometimes we let the kids go without collecting everything we need from them. Social security numbers are, are a big one. If we have their social security number, they track themselves automatically, like they're in the system, they're filing somewhere for taxes and such. We need to cross-check what the state says with what data we've collected, because from what I've been told in the past, there's been reporting discrepancies where we've actually had higher placement, but the state didn't get it. Set the expectation of continued communication with students, meaning that if we lost track of them before they left, we need to be making that constant contact so they're ready to hear from us at any point. They love to hear from us. We're gonna to continue to build community connections to get students into the regional workforce and continue to utilize CTE best practices and skill checkpoints to ensure that they're ready to get a job or go on to that post-secondary institution. We will check at the beginning and end of year. We will cross-reference that data. Parent Square failed reports um, let us know what homes aren't getting our information. So by checking those and updating those, it would allow us to keep constant contact, logs of monthly progress from the responsible parties, and verifying that teachers are maintaining their professional organization memberships and attending meetings, and that mainly deals with having those kids that are really ready to do what they're doing next, what's after us. 
that's just Perkins data that hasn't been updated since 1819. They haven't rated us. So this is our last rating, and you see placement is our red area where we need an improvement plan. And that's all I have for the ACC. Thank you. Next, we would like to call up Joellen Raby from the Area Career Center University. Hello, everyone. I feel Hello. like I'm on Shark Tank. <laughs> <laughs> Superintendent Miller, President Mamala, and trustees, I'm Joellen Raby, and I am the principal of the Area Career Center University. I'm out. Yes. The that was a joke. That secret was a joke. in Hammond. <laughs> yes. Uh, if you ha aren't familiar with the university, it's a small early college program that is in its seventh year of existence here in the school city of Hammond. The students apply to the school. Traditionally, we vet all applications. We interview every student who applies. In normal years, we usually have 250 applications, and we end up admitting 90 to 100 freshmen every year. But this being the exceptional year that it was, we had very few applications, so I only uh, had to turn away maybe 10 kids. So we accepted 10, 100 students as freshmen. So my numbers right now are really rather high at 297 students between the four grade levels. Of those, 115, 40% are male, 60% female. We have a, no Native American. We have only one Asian student. The balance of the students are between the African American of course, the Hispanic and the white, and with a skosh of multiracial, much like representing the entire district. We do have quite a few, 24, 25% of my students are gifted learners, and I believe that they're drawn to the program because of the rigor of the program. It being an early college program, they understand from the first that as freshmen, they're going to be taking college classes through Vincennes University. And I feel for a lot of those kids, that's very attractive to them and their parents. We have very few special education students, very few apply, as well as very few English language learners apply. That's why those numbers are so low. And again, I think our, our free and reduced lunch data is pretty similar to the rest of the school, maybe district, maybe a little bit less. Now, when we were asked to uh, do this fourth indicator for our school improvement plan. I informed Dr. Yanders that I have very few special education students because that was supposed to be our focus. So instead of focusing on special ed, I focused on our freshman population that we all know freshman year is the most impactful year. We can predict student success the freshman year. So just as any other school has, we have our battles with our freshmen. So I focused on them and tried trying very hard to lessen the number of freshmen who earn two or more Fs any given semester. Again, this is going to be an exceptional year because of communication, but we are giving it our best shot. Rules and responsibilities, they really aren't going to be any different for this, this plan than we've enacted for the last seven years. There's so much communication between my teachers, students, parents, with my counselor, Ms. Camacho, and with me. And as I, I state in the first paragraph, the ACCU teachers do have a collective mindset in mastery. So my teachers let students uh, make up work that is missed. They let students uh, take quizzes and tests over because our, our mindset is mastery of the subject area so they can move on. The ACCU counselor, Juanita Camacho, will then identify and she meets with the students. Again, that's going to be difficult with this year of the COVID, with the struggling students to determine, identify student needs and strengths. And then, again, that cycle, she's going to communicate with the teachers. And of course, she communicates with me. Then I receive communications from counselors, teachers, and parents, and students. I get a lot of emails from my kids. I meet with students and I communicate with parents to problem solve how to help their kids. 
and then I, in turn, respond back to the parents and the teachers. So, it first starts with the teachers identifying the struggling students. They offer support to all of their students, but especially those who are struggling, and they meet together in both subject area and as grade level teams. Students participate in tutoring opportunities that we have provided. We've got a tutor for math and Spanish from Vincennes University. Our National Honor Society students are tutoring the freshmen. We had a mentorship program in the last four years that has been very successful. And uh, then teacher office hours. Teachers report failing grades and then I communicate with parents. Teachers will communicate with the counselor and principal on student progress. Student grade reports are run bi-weekly. And teachers and leadership team members, I have three leadership team members, will problem solve strategies to assist students. Thank you very much. I appreciate your attention. Everybody stay healthy. Mr. Miller. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The uh, data for the demographics is not inputted into the uh, screen. I'm, I don't have that information. I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't hear that. I couldn't hear you, I'm sorry. Hmm? I, I said the data, the demographics data is not inputted into um, into the online presentation uh, yes okay yes. I'll, I'll get you an updated copy of that uh. sorry thank you next up to the podium we'd like to welcome dave verda all right good evening superintendent miller president omala members of the board i am here to talk about george rogers clark school uh, stu school improvement plan looking specifically at goal number four so first slide here, we have our, our demographics. We currently have about 1,244 students. Um, that number probably dropped a little bit the last couple of weeks. Um, we have 139 African-American students, 908 Latino Hispanic students, 167 Caucasians. Um, and then if you look on the right side here, we have 156 um, students receiving special ed services, and then 260 um, English learners. So we have uh, quite diverse here at, at Clark here. Going on to the next slide, looking at goal number four, by June of 2021, there will be a 5% decrease in the number of failing grades for our students who receive special education services. Uh, and if you look down here at this chart, this is from 2019-2020 uh, semester one. Okay, so we had uh, a total of 188 Fs given from high school and middle school combined uh, for our students that were receiving special ed services, okay? So out of all the grades possible given, there were 987 of them, and then 188 of those were Fs, okay? So we're at about 19, 20% of students receiving Fs for, uh, in the special ed population, okay? So we're gonna look at decreasing the overall number of Fs given, okay, by 5%. And as you know, this is our last year, so we, we wanna do the best we can here to close the, the school year off. Um, so looking at ways to do that and helping us be successful, we have to look at the instruction because we want to make sure our students are receiving uh, effective daily instruction, okay? And the strategies on the right are strategies that have been a part of Clark for about two years now um, that we have seen be the most effective. Um, so usually in the past we would put like 15 or 16 interventions in there on our school improvement plan. Uh, but this year we said, hey, let's, let's look at what really has worked for our students and showed success and just focus on those. Um, and, and we did that by monitoring all last year, having discussions with our teachers, looking at the NWA data, um, classroom work from our students. And these are the ones that our teachers felt like really were the most effective. Um, so what we're going to do to monitor the academic interventions, we're going to do obviously our walkthroughs. Um, we're doing virtual walkthroughs right now. We're going to analyze student work, our department heads, our team leads are going to analyze the work with our instructional coach. Um, we're going to continue doing surveys to monitor engagement and effectiveness. Um, and then we'll be using exact path here shortly next week. I believe that window opens. Um, th that's the new district assessment. So we'll be using that. Uh, then other goals, um, we have a student support team that came through the ASCA model. Our counselors lead that, but administrators, our instructional coach, case manager, school psychologist, our attendance group, we're all a part of this committee. Um, and we focus on our three A's. This is something we've been doing for two years now. Um, so all of our meetings, everything we do, we focus on attendance, attitude, uh, which is like our SEL component now, social emotional learning, and then our academics, making sure our students are taking care of their responsibilities. 
Um, and then uh, also help us, we're gonna have our TORs, which are our teachers of records, um, con uh, conduct check and connects with our students, our special ed students, um, and also their SLOs are gonna be directly linked to um, student success, making sure that they are earning credits and they're not failing classes. Um, as well as just our, our normal meetings that we have uh, monthly with our faculty, keeping our goals in mind, really stressing which, what we're trying to achieve. Okay, then here's the roles and responsibilities for administration, instructional coach, faculty, and staff. Um, I, I don't think you guys want me to go through every bullet, but I can. Do I have time? No? Okay. Thank you, guys. Thank you. So Mr. Thank Verda mentioned, one second, Mr. Verda mentioned um, a teacher's SLO. Again, anybody who's watching who's not familiar with that, that's essentially the goal for a teacher. It's one of the parts of their evaluation. And uh, so they're tying that to uh, the student success to make sure the teacher's evaluation is tied to the success of the students in that program. Let's welcome Edison's principal, Amy Yos. Good evening, uh, Superintendent Miller, President Mamala, Board of Trustees. I'm excited to be here today to talk about Edison's goal four. So our demographics at Edison, you'll notice we are predominantly Hispanic. We have 30% black, 17% um, white. Um, on the right side of that, um, you're going to see our special education is at 16%, our EL population is at 16%, and our students qualifying for free and reduced uh, meals is at 77%. Um, each of those areas is above the district average, so that's important to note. Um, and our transiency rate is about 6% as well. So our goal for Edison for this school year is by June of 2020, students will improve their daily attendance as evidenced by a 7% decrease of students with 10 or more absences as indicated by Power School. So you'll notice some alarming stats on here, um, specifically the students with 21 or more absences. That's a major concern for us at Edison. Um, and when we are thinking about our kindergarten, first and second grade students, we know that when they are missing 10 or more days of school that they are less likely to be proficient at reading in third grade and we know that our students that are not proficient readers at third grade unfortunately are four times more likely to drop out of high school so early intervention is key um, and I think most elementary principals will agree with me on that piece um, and then when we're looking at the growth impact we see a direct correlation um, between how our students are performing on I learn with the amount of days they are missing so 38.4% uh, show low growth if they miss less than 10 days, and 75% show low growth if they miss more than 10 days in ELA. And we see the same data for our math as well. The strategies that we're going to be using are a five-pillar approach to improving attendance. So we are going to monitor data, engage students and families, recognize good and approved attendance, provide personalized personalized outreach and then remove barriers. And this looks different with all of our students. So a tier one um, intervention for monitoring data is gonna look different than our tier three approach for our students who are chronically absent. Um, so we break it down in that, in that area. Our roles and responsibilities, we're not going to improve attendance unless we make it a collective effort. So um, everyone in the building has a role, um, myself, my clerical staff, parents and students, a big part of their role is really taking advantage of the supports made available. That's a big piece. We have a lot of supports uh, available to our parents. We wanna make sure that they're taking advantage of those resources. And monitoring, we are doing weekly attendance checks, uh, weekly student progress monitoring for our tier three students to track their attendance. We're checking in and checking out and doing reports for those tier three students. And then we're also having a weekly outreach committee data review to go over our students who are chronically absent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We would like to welcome Eggers Principal Angela Johnson. Yay. Good evening, President Good evening. Miller, Good evening. or Superintendent Miller, President Mamala, and School Board of Trustees. My name is Angela Johnson, and I'm the proud principal of Eggers Middle School. 
Eggers is responsible for educating 749 students, and as you can see, about 51% of those students are male and 49% female. We have about 49% African American, 41% Hispanic, 6% white, 4% multiracial, and one Asian student. 17% of those students are special ed learners, and 12% are English language learners, and 84% of our students qualify for free or reduced lunch. Eggers is a CSI school, and so our goal for this school year is to increase achievement in both proficiency and growth by 5% in both ELA and math as measured by the iLearn assessment. So the data that you see before you is the last assessment that students took pre-COVID. So looking at those NWEA scores that they took in the fall and winter of 2019, um, we use that data to make sure that we focus on our current eighth graders and our current seventh graders. And so we are heavily monitoring those eighth grade students because if you notice, they took a significant drop in ELA um, before COVID hit and before we left and a slight drop in their math growth scores. Our current seventh graders, when they were sixth graders, they increased their growth in ELA, but they took a slight dive in their math. So those two grade levels are being heavily monitored with the strategies that we have in place. And those strategies are embedded remediation time with 80 minute class periods. So I was really happy to see that um, Eggers had gone to a block schedule. Um, I was familiar with block scheduling from my last schools that I participated in and I do know that there's a lot of advantages to that. Um, that offers more one-to-one -one time, more small group instruction, and more time for enrichment for those individual groups. Those teachers are gonna use their data to drive instruction and to track student progress on those critical standards and those ELA, ELA and math courses. And so we have a digital data wall for them to keep um, up with the student progress. We are also gonna increase PSYOP supports for our ELL students in all classes. Use the visual thinking strategy, which we have a PD in a couple of weeks. Um, and the race strategy will also be implemented across the school um, community, so school-wide strategies of visual thinking and race to help students with comprehension and critical thinking skills. Um, we're also implementing our professional learning cycles. So in those cycles, those are when teachers will disaggregate their data, look at their data, regroup students, and do what's necessary um, as far as adjusting instruction for those students. And we have also reassigned some teachers um, to positions that better suit their strengths. And also we've hired new staff um, at Eggers. So we're hoping to combat the, the transient rate of our teachers um, as well as students. And so how we plan to monitor this is through our exact path, which will um, be a district implementation as a quarterly benchmark. So that test, um, we also have created unit assessments in ELA and math, and those are given every six weeks. Actually, um, teachers are actually given the first one this week. Um, and then the teachers have weekly assessments to track student growth in those um, mastery areas. And the roles and responsibilities, myself, Dr. Jones, and Mr. Kajawa as the administrators, we are going to monitor the instruction, specifically the remediation groups. We're gonna analyze the data, evaluate our use of instructional strategies across our school, um, and we have our teacher leaders and our teachers who are going to use that data to drive and differentiate instruction uh, within those 80 minute blocks and we're also gonna implement a daily practice of test taking strategies in our bell ringers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Please welcome Regina Grohar from Franklin. Good evening, Superintendent Miller, President Mamala, and Board of Trustees. I'll be presenting Franklin Elementary's goal number four 
With our demographic data, we have 268 students at Franklin, primarily um, Hispanic at 64%. Some important things to note about our demographic information, if you look at our free and reduced lunch, it's at 76%. Two years ago, it was only at 60%. So in two years, it's rose 16% in nature, so we are seeing that change in uh, climate at Franklin. Um, our transient rate is at 6.5%, and that's mostly in the upper grades. Only 30% of our fifth graders have been there for three or more years. So we're seeing that in the upper grades. So our goal number four is by the end of the school year, students will show a 10% de decrease in the number of physical aggression disciplinary infractions as measured by discipline reporting in power school. Now I know what you might be thinking, why did we pick discipline when we're in the middle of a pandemic and they're at home? So when we looked at all of our data combined with what the district goals already are, we thought about what can we have the biggest impact with even though they're at home. So to support this goal, we're gonna be focusing a lot on SEL, which we can do at home uh, through the computer with the kids. We just might not see those results until they're back in person. So for those roles and responsibilities, oh, um, the teachers and everybody across the board will be implementing the IDOE SEL competencies, participating in morning meetings. Our monthly classroom lessons will be done by a counselor. We have uh, monthly su student support team meetings where we look at data, we look at student behavior and all of those things and make adjustments to the school as necessary and our positive office referrals. For our strategies, the SEL activities during morning meetings will specifically be focusing on care and concern for others in peer conflict to show students how to resolve conflicts peacefully. A lot of what we're seeing does usually happen more at recess and lunch, so we want them to be able to use their words and not pinching and pushing and things like that. So those are the strategies we're going to be teaching them. All staff will be participating. It's a school-wide goal, so LDP, specials, teachers, recess aides, everybody. The SEL activities will also be implemented during core instruction. For the teachers, this might look like grouping, teaching students how to respectfully disagree and agree, turn taking, empathy, etc. Uh, Franklin is fortunate to have a school counselor and she does monthly lessons for every single class at Franklin and they are, those lessons are SEL focused as well. And lastly, we will focus on the recess aids and continue to implement the Playworks program, um, the use of calm down strategies and conflict resolution. They will continue to learn more strategies through the participation of morning meeting as well as additional professional development provided by myself, our counselor, and the district. And for monitoring, what we're gonna do is I should be able to see that teachers are teaching students how to show kindness and positive regard for others, building relationships with adults, understanding and create meaning from others' verbal and nonverbal communication skills, being able to read and respond to others' emotions and needs. So how do we know if the students are gonna be able to do this? Well, we're gonna look to see that they're doing those things that I just mentioned. And of course, once we're in person, we'd be able to look at that discipline data as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Please come on up, Gavitz, Michelle Landis. Okay. <laughs> um, good evening, President Mamala, Superintendent Miller, and board members. Um, my name is Michelle Andes. I'm here to present tonight um, on Gavit. And it's coming. Um, I can go ahead and go with some of the data. Um, luckily, I have it here. Gavit has a total of about 1,500 uh, students, about half male, half female um, are in our demographics. We have about 40% African American, about 40% Hispanic, about 16% white, and about 3% multiracial. Um, we have the largest population of special, exceptional learners, special education. Um, we have over 212 students, which comes out to about 13.6% of our students. We have about 90 or 98 EL learners, which comes out to about 6.3% of our students. And we have about 78% of our students qualify for a free reduced lunch. Our transient rate is about 6.3%. 
So our goal is with our 212 special education students, um, by June of 2021, there will be a 5% decrease in the number of failing grades for our students who receive special education services as measured by the student grade data in PowerSchool. So if we look at the semester data failure from last semester, first semester, um, out of 1,274 total grades, um, our special education students received 220 failing um, grades which comes out to about 17% of Fs. If you look at that, I separate it amongst middle and high school, um, and it's just a little bit higher um, in the high school than it is in the middle school, but it's pretty similar. Um, so the roles and responsibilities. We look at everything with our students in terms of helping our students both academically and helping our students uh, emotionally through the behavior. And so our roles and responsibilities um, with our special education students are pretty much the same roles with every student within our building, um, but we also do provide extra services for our students to help support them and encourage them so that they can find success. So academically, um, as the others had mentioned, previously. Um, administration, instructional coaches, monitor, um, come in, provide assistance and support to the teachers in the classroom. Behaviorally, we create that growth mindset, uh, develop PBIS initiatives. Um, the general education teachers incorporate um, instructional strategies. They differentiate instruction. Um, they communicate with the parents. And the big piece that the general education teachers do to help our students is that chunking of pieces, which is a, is a wonderful instructional tool for our students to understand the content. Behaviorally, the general education education teachers help with the PBIS, um, you know, the SEL components, character lessons, help with student reflection. Um, our special education teachers academically, they co-teach um, and um, they work with the students and they daily meet with our special education students through resource period. So there is that one-on-one -on -one contact with the TOR and the special education students every single day. Um, they monitor, they help the teachers. Um, and then behaviorally, those, those special education teachers have a smaller advisory so they can meet with those kids. Our counselors are also an important role um, in ma maintaining that our special education students um, get support. They have bi-weekly meetings, they check for grades, they have the kids do grade reflections, and behaviorally, they, they try to teach our kids to self-advocate for themselves. Um, that's a really important um, skill that we want all of our students to know, but especially our special education students. So if you go to the next slide, um, we do a lot of research base and, and look at different strategies um, to incorporate. We look at Tomlinson, Marzano, um, looking at best ways to help our learners um, exceed. And so we've come up with nine different modifications and accommodations that we use within the classroom to help not just special education learners, but all of our learners succeed. And, and some of the strategies are, you know, um, like I mentioned earlier about chunking, but also about output. Um, accepting, instead of the traditional ways of just taking tests, we're allowing all of our students to verbally tell us what they know. Um, you know, um, giving them more time, level of support, um, you know, substitute the curriculum to, to have curriculum to where it's relevant to them um, and, and understand the importance of what it is that we need them to um, attain to. So, the last thing I want to talk about is monitoring. So this year, um, we've decided with the student support team as part of the Lilly Grant, um, where the TORs, which are the teacher of record, the deans, the counselors, and the administration, um, they meet uh, with their students uh, daily during uh, the, the basic skills classes. But what we do is every four weeks on the 14th of the month, um, the special education teachers do a reflection sheet on every single child that they have under their teacher of record. And we look at what classes the kids are passing, what classes the kids are struggling in, and we have that reflection with the students and as a team to kind of come up with different strategies to help support the student and get that student input on what can we do to help you succeed. So that's um, kind of our at-risk plans for those special education students that is really going to decrease the number of um, Fs. So that's it. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Please welcome Dr. Johnny Goodlow from Hammond High. Good evening, Madam President, Superintendent Miller, Board of School Trustees. I am Dr. Goodlow, Principal of Hammond High School, and this is our goal number four. Um, Hammond High School currently has 879 scholars, which is currently a 7% increase from our enrollment last year. Uh, of those scholars, we have 53% male, 46% female, 50% uh, black, 43% Hispanic, 3% white, 4.2% 4, 4 multiracial. And we have 134 uh, special needs scholars, which constitutes 15% of our population, and 83 English language learners, which constitutes 9.4% of our population. We also are 78% of our scholars receive free or reduced lunch at our school. So our goal uh, is by the end of the 2021 school year, there'll be a 5% decrease in the number of filling grades for our scholars who receive special education services as measured by the student grade data in PowerSchool. So at this time last year, we had an increase um, in failures school-wide, specifically in special education. Um, at that point, we looked at 64 scholars with 448 grades that were issued to those special needs scholars, and there was about 26% failure within in those scholars. So we had started some things last year. We're going to continue some of those initiatives, but we're also going to look toward uh, strengthening our special needs teachers because a lot of them are still new within the profession and still has to learn best practices. So within the next slide, you'll see how we break down our roles and responsibilities via academic and behaviorally. We have a consultant through uh, IIEP, his name is Mr. Victor Torres, and he, along with our special ed case manager and myself, will be conducting professional development on the six models of co-teaching specifically for our special needs department, but uh, also focusing on how to differentiate intentionally to scaffold that learning for our special needs population. Uh, we will conduct the meaningful walkthroughs throughout this whole process that we'll be doing it and presenting our data within our faculty meetings via via our MTSS team. Uh, for the behavioral aspect, we'll develop uh, PBIS initiatives and present data on our attendance and discipline and model our SEL initiatives because that's another big initiative that we have at Hema High School uh, for our faculty. The educators, uh, we're focusing on not just SEL but culturally responsive practices. So we've had several uh, professional development series on trauma responsive classrooms and culturally responsive practices. And so we're looking for them to incorporate those strategies within the classroom and also follow, follow our HHS uh, failure protocol where we have to intentionally uh, contact and do our part as educators to keep our parents and guardians informed uh, within what's going on within their child and try to stop the, the amount of failures that we have. So much so that th unless this protocol is followed, you cannot fail a kid at Hammond High School. Um, we're still doing our power initiative through a, uh, IXL and also we're incorporating exact path as well for English and math as far as that intentional remediation. Um, and then our counselors and co workers, uh, we have a social worker also through our uh, Title I funds, and I'm going to get into more of what that component looks like on the next slide. Um, so one of our intentional strategies is a program that we developed last year called The Significant with uh, Dr. Anthony Grady and Healthy Heart, Healthy Minds. Uh, that is our tier three intervention that we use for our scholars that um, are basically in real need of wraparound services. And so this year, Dr. Grady has 17 males and Ms. Spinks has 12 females where they conduct groups, parental conferences, and monitor their progress throughout the year. Last year, this program had a significant impact on our senior class. We were able to graduate six males that were totally off from graduating by the end of the year, which was significant through Dr. Grady's assistance with this program. And then we're also going to celebrate uh, and come from a po positive aspect as far as attendance and behavior through our PBIS initiatives. The monitoring will take place through weekly intentional walkthroughs by the instructional coaches and the Hemma High administration. Uh, our MTSS team will meet weekly, and that consists of our social worker, dean, SCI counselors, uh, Dr. Anthony Grady with Healthy Heart, Healthy Minds, and our parent community liaison. And in those meetings, we talk weekly about the tier support data that we have as far as attendance and behaviors, uh, PBIS initiatives that we're doing, and when necessary, individual MTSS plans for scholars. And we'll keep everybody updated on that through cluster professional development development for our staff and bi-monthly at our faculty meetings. Thank you for your time. Thank you. 
Thank you. At this time, we would like to welcome Harding Husky, Ray Liskey. <laughs> I'll just say while Ray walks up, you may see he came in late because they had activity at Harding uh, tonight, so um, he had let, uh, let us know. So I'm glad you're here. Thanks, Thanks very much. I was expecting a walk-up song when you said that. But <laughs> <clears throat> Good evening, board. Mr. Miller, thank you for having me. I'm here to present School Improvement Plan Goal Number 4. By June 2021, Harding Elementary School will demonstrate a 5% increase in parent participation in all three of the content-specific family events and a 30% increase in PTA membership as measured by the Title I parent sign-in documentation and our PTA paid memberships. Um, from, from a look at our demographics, you can see that we have a high percent of English learners, IEPs, a high percentage of non-white families, and we basically need to connect with all of our families. And because of this, and with this in mind, we have to have all of our kids, our parents and families, be able to give them a voice in everything that we do, both during the school day and outside the school day when we connect with them. This is why strengthening families and relationships at Harding is so important. Harding had a reduced role in impact in our PTA last year and our lowest membership in the last five years. We're down to 141, and if, if our goal is to increase 30%, uh, we would like to get up to 183. We've been a 250 plus um, unit in past years, so we definitely think we can do that. Um, tonight was our first drive-through social distant event and we grabbed a couple more about 10 more memberships along the way so it was really nice and reaching out to parents parents get to see us and it's a really great thing um, so last year we had a lower amount at our literacy night math night science night all those content activities and this year our theme is together we're better so we're really trying to make that happen at Harding <clears throat> When teachers connect with families, students don't want to miss the class, the work, the activities, the events, everything that we do. We seek every opportunity to connect with them and with the teachers. We've seen examples of this online and we saw it tonight. The family facilitator is part of our community. Uh, she's someone that will help us and begin to get parents to work with our kids. Last year she was involved in getting parent volunteers, well, one's still on the last one, uh, still in getting parent volunteers to work with our kids to do some reading, some letter recognition, some volunteering at school events. Um, my job along with Taylor, our assistant to the principal, is to monitor those groups so that we can plan and act those activities, tracking those attendance and making sure that we're increasing the membership and getting more engagement in our community. So last year we began planning with our PTA. We talked about our membership goal. We started thinking about this virtually. This is what we plan as a group. Um, I've been thinking about this for about a year now, thinking about how we can connect with families that don't can't, can't come to the evening. Even if we were live, there are some families that just can't come after school, whether they work or do other things. So COVID kind of gave us the opportunity to find a way to involve families that are not at school, but still get them going with you and doing things like that. Virtual events live activities online. Um, so many possibilities now and later, and I think that there's so much to go there. With Facebook, Twitter, Parent Square, we can communicate faster, more effectively. We can still offer PTA incentives. Um, again, our family facilitator helps provide PD and family connection strategies at staff meetings, at family events, and uh, again, through emails and videos. Again, it helps our families to connect at their own time frame over several days. So tracking all of this is, is my responsibility. This is what I'm going to be doing. We'll be using this chart as we go throughout the year. Um, our projections, again, are 5% increasing. Our goals are very transparent, and we want everybody to know that these are the things that we're trying to do. We want to connect with our families. We want our families, kids, and staff to work together to do things. And again, we'll get feedback from our parents and we're gonna meet our goals this year. Okay, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Next, I would like to welcome our newest principal from Hess, Katie Pieta. Good evening, Superintendent Miller, evening. President Mamala and Board of Trustees. This is our school improvement plan presentation for goal number four. We currently have about 586 students in our school. This is down from last year in which we had about 629 students. 
52% of our population is male and 47% female. 40% um, of our students are African American, about 40% Hispanic or Latino, 13% white, 6% multicultural. Of that, we have 77 special education students, 47 English language learners, and 466 of our students qualify for free or reduced lunch. So our goal for this year was to um, decrease the number of discipline referrals resulting from students' inabilities to self-regulate, meaning running from the classroom, having physical outbursts, uh, physical aggression, et cetera. And we'd like to de decrease those referrals by 25%. Um, some of our strategies for that would be morning meetings. This is something that we can do virtually to try to address the needs of our students. Administrators will model these strategies at our monthly staff meetings, and teachers will utilize that daily in their classrooms. We're also going to implement daily mood meters, so that way students have an opportunity to self-monitor their moods and emotions as well. We'll provide SEL support through mindfulness practices. We do this on our daily live announcements through breathing strategies. When we're in person, we have cool down corners in every classroom and we um, allow scheduled breaks for some of our students. We also want to encourage staff connections. Um, every student should have at least two staff members that they can turn to for advice or encouragement. We have check-in and check-out for some of our students who are having a more difficult time with self-regulation. And we want to increase communication with parents regarding self-regulation. So roles and responsibilities, all teachers will be responsible for hosting that morning meeting to model and promote self-regulation. When we return to in-person learning, each classroom will have a cool down corner that is a place in the classroom that students can go when they are having just really big emotions and they need a minute to try to calm themselves back down. Teachers will implement daily mood meters. When we return to in-person, again, students will identify those two staff members so they can feel a connection and a part of our school community. And we will increase support by administrators in our kindergarten classrooms. Of our 799 discipline referrals last year, 271 of those were from kindergarten. So we need to um, increase our support there. Um, also, we'd like to increase professional development in the area of self-regulation strategies for students, including culturally responsive teaching and some restorative justice practices. How we will monitor that, excuse me, monitor that will be through um, lesson plans that are submitted weekly, which will document which strategies are being taught. We will also be doing um, informal observations or walkthroughs. We can do that even in the virtual setting followed by administrative feedback. Um, we'll also collect data from surveys and monitor that data um, so we can see if those numbers of office referrals are going down once we return to in-person learning. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Please welcome from Irvie, Irving, Sarah Kylander. Good evening, Superintendent Miller, President Mamala, members of the board. I'm the assistant to the principal at Irving and I'm happy to be here tonight. If you look at our demographics, some highlights of our community, we have 68% Hispanic or Latino students, as well as 20, almost 27% of our students are English language learners. Um, I would like to point out that last year we were talking about Irving as the new Irving, since we were still merging communities with the Columbia School and Lafayette School coming. And we also implemented the dual language program last year. Last year was also the first year in many years that we did not meet our attendance goal. So our main focus this year is that by the end of this school year, we will see a 5% decrease in student tardies and an increase in student attendance to 95%. Our evidence-based strategy is going to be all about social-emotional learning. At Irving, our social-emotional learning focus areas are safety, connection, and mental wellness. 
because when students feel safe, connected, and have a positive mental well-being, that directly impacts their attendance, engagement, and achievement. So our evidence-based strategies, we've taken all the guesswork away for the teachers. We have a weekly social-emotional calendar that's hyperlinked with lessons for them to follow. It includes lessons from the Pearson Peak curriculum, the IDOE toolkit, teacher created resources, and as well as our weekly announcements where we promote that theme and create a common language for the school. We'll monitor that goal for teachers by observing their morning meetings and social emotional lessons using a specific feedback tool that we created that aligns to our goal. We'll monitor student attendance through PowerSchool. We are looking for model attendance and social emotional meetings, as well as that 5% decrease in tardies and an ultimate goal of 95% attendance rate. For roles and responsibilities, we've taken on a team effort in the instructional staff and administrators. Teachers will implement I'm assigned to creating those social emotional lessons and resources. Our assistant principal will be monitoring mental wellness resources. Our instructional coach is promoting professional development for teachers and our principal modeling safety practices as well as all of us using the observation tool for feedback and monitoring. So far, I'm proud to say that first quarter data shows that we have a 90% success rate in meeting all of those indicators. And moving forward, we're going to start to refine. Right now, our average attendance is 93%. So I have no doubt that we will meet that 95% goal. And we're also starting to work on incorporating those SEL elements throughout the course of the entire school day with an upcoming PD on student engagement. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Please welcome from Jefferson, Dr. Denise Eisman. Hello, Superintendent Miller, President Mamala, members of the board, happy to be here. So our fourth goal, well, go right to the first demographics. So our demographics look very similar to um, everyone else in Hammond. Our transient rate is particularly low. It seems when people come to Jefferson, they seem to stay, which is a nice thing. But the thing that really steps out is our number of exceptional learners in special ed, which is at 23%, which is the highest in the district. Um, this is because we have a number of programs that we service and all of our students are included in the general ed classrooms. So we have students with hearing impairments, we have students with visual impairments, we also have students with autism, but they are completely fully included in the classrooms, which is a wonderful uh, dynamic for everyone. So in looking at, especially this time of COVID, our fourth goal is family engagement. Kind of moving away from potlucks and those sort of things to more actively learning and working with teachers, working with parents about instructional strategies that they can do at home. And that's become extremely important during this particular time. We based our data on our Title I Family Friendly Survey, which came back and said that 85% of our parents felt that we um, listened to what their needs are, but we want to increase that up to 100%. So the strategies that we're going to use to reach out to our parents is to monitor um, and use Parent Square, making sure that everyone has some type of way to be connected to us at school, and offer monthly workshops based on real-time learning experiences given by our teachers. So as we're trying to go through, when you have a child that's having particular difficulty um, with behavior or sitting um, to finish some work that they have to do, teachers actually coming in with strategies that they can work with parents in real time. Focus on those various special groups, especially our students with hearing impairments or students with autism that have sensory issues about having these masks that they are having to wear to be safe, but just teaching them different ways to do those kind of things. We're going to showcase our student achievement and we're going to collect and share frequent feedback from families. The roles and responsibilities, obviously all of our teachers are, will be involved in this, but our family involvement coordinator, Mrs. Balio, will put those things together for us. We're fortunate to have a wonderful counselor, Mrs. 
B. Claiborne, who is with us, and she's already reached out to um, our parents, helping with the social, emotional, and, and just mental fatigue going on currently in current times. Mrs. Lefebvre is our school psych, and she will be working and coordinating focus groups for particular groups that need that additional help. And Mrs. Wright, our assistant to the principal, making positive phone calls home. And we will be implementing coffee with the principal virtually, focusing on monthly topics. Our monitoring will be Parent Square, Parent Workshop attendance data virtually. Uh, weekly showcase of students and a calendar of events to include the minutes from our focus groups, monthly coffees, and parent workshops. We really just want to get out there and be available to everyone and, and because parents are the first teachers. So that's our goal. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Please welcome from Kenwood Elementary, Mary Reichel. Good evening, Superintendent Miller, President Mamala, and Board of Trustees. Um, let me tell you a little bit about Kenwood. So we have about 279 students. You can see we're pretty much equally split between male and female. We have a 53% African-American group, 28% Hispanic group, and equally distributed between white and multiracial groups. Our exceptional special education learners, about 10%. English learners, almost 12% and our free and reduced percentage is almost at 80%. So goal four for Kenwood is that Kenwood Elementary School will achieve satisfactory attendance of 95% by the end of 2021 school year as measured by attendance data presented in PowerSchool. You'll notice our attendance data over the past few years, we have not quite met that 95% benchmark, and that is a benchmark set by the state. We all know that attendance directly impacts academics. So we want to make sure that our students are in attendance so that we can improve those academics. And just so you know, 95% um, means that a student cannot be absent nine, more than nine times during the school year. Okay. So some of our roles and responsibilities we have just distributed, you'll notice that they revolve around monitoring and making connections with our families. That means outreach to individual families um, by myself, by our office manager, also by a counselor, as well as teachers and um, other leadership teams. Some of the strategies we've put in place are weekly meetings with myself, our office manager and counselor to meet and discuss the weekly attendance data, um, family support surveys that will go out, outreach to families, so we've talked about phone calls, sometimes it's emails, we also send parent square messages to, to inform our parents where their attendance is for each of their children. We want to provide support to reduce the barriers of our kids not coming to school. So we do that through our outreach with our counselor. If we see an attendance issue happening, we have um, counselor reach out and see if there's any support that we can put in place for that family. We also have talked about PBIS challenges. You may have seen some of those on Facebook. And um, overall, just keeping that positive, engaging, supportive school environment that Kenwood is well known for. For monitoring, we have monitoring systems on a daily, weekly, and monthly basis. On a daily basis, teachers and office manager monitor the attendance. We make daily phone calls to any child who is marked as truant and we do that throughout the day. So as teachers post attendance, we are making phone calls directly to those families, making sure right now that the child is logged on online. Weekly, we have meetings to discuss any trends that we see. And then of course, monthly, our leadership team meets um, to again, look at those trends and to see if we can put any systems in place for our families who may need more support with attendance. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Please welcome Yolanda Bracy from Lincoln Elementary. I feel so special. <laughs> Good evening, Superintendent Miller, President Mamala, and school board members. As you can see, our highest population at Lincoln is our Hispanic population, and our African American population is steadily growing. And we have 28.4% of ELL or English language learners. And I don't know why the transiency rate didn't pop up, but it's around 7%. 
So it's no secret that we've always had a lot of parent involvement. You know, our PTA last year, we had over 400 members. But one thing we found that we were concerned about, um, it was in the area of parent-teacher conferences where normal, we normally have about 85% of our parents participate. And last year, it had dropped down to 61 and 63%. So our goal is to increase both of those areas by 5% this school year. Um, we're going to do that. My responsibility is to model, collaborate, identify, and ensure that these things are happening. Um, my assistant principal is going to continue to create calendars for our parents. She's going to serve as a liaison, and she's going to continue to support our academics and ESL, as well as assist with planning and implementation. Our Title I parent facilitator is going to continue to coordinate and document all of our family activities. And then our powerful PTSA president and team, they're going to continue to create PTSA activities for our families. And um, our teachers are all on board. They're going to continue to post weekly in Parent Square, and they're doing a phenomenal job with that. Um, our families, or they're also going to provide our families with um, great level brochures, and I think I have shared some of those with the board, and they are amazing. Um, all of our staff members are going to encourage family involvement, and they've all agreed to promote and post positive things about Lincoln on social media and in Parent Square. Um, we are going to. As for our strategies, we are going to continue to uh, post on Parent Square. We're going to continue our Facebook Live announcements. Some of those are hilarious. We're going to continue with our outreach team, uh, the Great Level Brochures. Um, Ms. Vasquez and I will resume our brainstorming and vision sessions with parents. Um, we're going to continue to send out our calendar and our newsletter to parents, and we're going to make sure we, out, we reach out to our parents by making phone calls and emails. And then we're also going to monitor by um, it'll, the sign-in sheets um, for those who attend our parent-teacher conferences, our family participation, and then um, we're going to show progress again when we increase both areas by 5%. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Please welcome Latera Smith from Maywood Elementary. Thank you for that introduction, Mrs. Danko. You're welcome. <laughs> Good evening, Superintendent Miller, President Mamala, and the School Board of Trustees. I am Latera Smith, and I am presenting our school improvement goal for Maywood Elementary School. You currently see our demographics for Maywood, with our highest um, demographic group being our Black or African American at 424 students, followed by our Hispanic population, um, which is number two of 195 students. Um, we're pretty even with our male and female, with 49% male and 51% female. Um, if you look over to the right, our special education is 101 students. Our English language learners, which is a, a growing population for our schools, at 85 students. And our students that qualify for free and reduced meals are 513 students, with a transient rate of 11%. Our goal for Maywood Elementary School is to achieve attendance average of 95% by the end of this academic school year. Um, the rationale for our goal is the 2019-20 school year attendance rate of 91.5%. I'm proud to say that currently our weekly average rate is increasing to 93.2%. Um, and we strongly believe that if we increase, increase student achievement, that that is a great predictor for increasing our student achievement. Our student attendance will increase our student achievement. If we have them um, present in the building, we're able to educate them and give them the skills and tools that they need to be successful. Some of our strategies for achieving our goal is our um, admin team will meet weekly to discuss our attendant issues, uh, reaching out to our families with family surveys, assessing their needs and concerns and their comfort comfortability level um, with our curriculum and within our school. Um, we want to work really hard to remove any barriers that our families may have when it comes to transportation, homelessness or health concerns, or any area that um, we can be in assistance in uh, providing them resources in which they are able to attend school regularly. We want to, Sorry. that's okay. <laughs> um, we want to make sure that we're making, um, connecting with positive support such as regional and McKinney Vento, um, establishing a positive and supportive relationship with the students and the family, making sure we're establishing a positive and supportive and engaging school climate. We want to have that open door policy and making sure that our families and students feel um, 
that our building is a place of loving, a loving building for all of our families to come into and for our students to become educated. Um, we're gonna have personalized and early outreach via phone calls and emails and parent square. Um, we want to communicate the importance of attendance and communicate the school and the district's expectations for attendance. Um, like many of the other schools through our PBIS, we have a lot of staff challenges, school-wide incentives that we're doing to increase our attendance goal and having community partners, making sure that our parents understand that parent um, school compact and um, having parent-teacher conferences. Uh, many of our stakeholders are involved in with roles and responsibilities, as we like to say, all hands on deck in order to um, achieve our goal. So our admin team, um, as well as all our other stakeholders, we're all responsible for outreach, um, connecting with our families. Um, some of the other responsibilities are uh, monitoring versus um, reading, reviewing the weekly attendance reports, um, making sure that we're having timely and accurate daily attendance posting by our teachers, um, and just making sure that we're communicating with those families and communicating with our staff. We have three major checkpoints for monitoring. We have a daily, weekly, and monthly uh, checkpoint. Daily, our office managers and teachers are monitor daily attendance and perform outreach to our families. Weekly, the admin team will review the attendance report and perform outreach, and then monthly, our leadership team will review attendance reports and we will look for patterns and chronic and severe absenteeism. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we would like to welcome from Morton Elementary School, newlywed, Alan Walzak. <laughs> Good afternoon, Superintendent Miller, um, President Mamala, also members of the board. I'm Alan Walzak, principal of elementary, uh, Morton Elementary, and I'm glad to be here. So you can, as you can see, um, we roughly have uh, 464 students total. Um, we're pretty, pretty close with our male and female population, 54% male, 46% female. Um, we do have age in students. We do have 29% uh, of our students, um, roughly one third are African American, or roughly 50% are Hispanic or Latino, 16% um, white. We do have 5% students multiracial. We have a roughly 16.5% of our students uh, are special education students, um, rounding up to 15% of our student body are English learners. And then finally, we have almost 80% of our students qualifying for free and reduced lunch. Our transiency rate is roughly 6.8%. So our fourth goal, um, we are going to re achieve a weekly attendance average of 95% by June 3rd, as measured by um, power school data. Uh, this year, when we started the year, we noticed that our attendance was, was very low. In uh, August, we were hovering in the 80s. Uh, and the week of 9-11, that was the week that we did the challenge with Ms. Yost and um, Edison Elementary. Our attendance average was around 90%, so we did see a little bit of a gain. We recently did a challenge with Kenwood Elementary, and we noticed that our attendance had risen even higher to 96%. But even though we're at that number, the key is staying there all year. Um, so we're going to be sharing our weekly attendance rates with all stakeholders, uh, meeting on a regular basis, uh, to provide incentives for those stakeholders as well. Uh, we got a three-level approach, similar to um, Maywood Elementary. Uh, we are at the building, grade level, and class level. Um, we're looking into the, we're looking into having monthly celebrations for um, our building. The principals are going to be involved in those celebrations. We're offering staff incentives for the classes that are getting the. We're going to offer staff incentives for the classes that are having good attendance, and we have been competing among the buildings to um, just make it fun for everyone involved. Uh, at the grade level, we have um, we would like to start weekly drawings, uh, gym activities, special special privileges, uh, having the principal be involved in those, and then at the class level, we have as listed um, the incentives. 
that we would like to begin. Also, the, the compacts, that's something that's stated uh, right in the compacts about the agreement between the parents and the school and the importance of their child's education. So we are having our parent-teacher conferences and that's gonna be a great time for us to check in with those parent, parents um, and discuss attendance. Here you can see who is responsible for what um, in achieving this goal. You can see that uh, the principals are primarily in responsible for what is listed here. Um, all stakeholders are, are responsible um, at every level. Um, and we wanted everyone to be responsible to monitor, motivate, and communicate to achieve this goal. And then monitoring are the steps that we're currently utilizing. We check daily on PowerSchool. Um, we do communicate with teachers daily. We do communicate with students daily. We, we do communicate with parents daily. Um, we are able to utilize PowerSchool to um, do this in a very efficient manner. It's a wonderful tool. Um, we do have our monthly progress uh, checks and our monthly percentages as well. Every month when we do our, our, um, our challenge, we are able to um, check those, those rates. And then finally, the indicators. We want to definitely increase our percentages, increase communication, increase student achievement, and see that decrease in unexcused absences. All right, thank you. Thank you and congratulations. <laughs> thank you. Please welcome for Morton High School Greg Easton for his last school improvement plan presentation ever. <laughs> that was pretty awesome. <laughs> pretty awesome. All right, so demographics. We have 1,252 students. What's kind of interesting is we have two American Indian students, two Asians, so they mirror each other. But then look at my black and Latino populations, 500 and 500. Wow. Exactly. So as I, and I'm looking again. Yeah, it's, it's going to be great for alignment for our two communities because we mm -hmm. really are absolutely so similar. Um, we have then a uh, 201 special education students at 16% of our population, 6% English learners, uh, language learners, and then we are 70% uh, with free and reduced lunch with a transient rate of 4.6%. Uh, like all the other secondary schools, uh, we plan a 5% decrease in the number of failing grades for our students who receive special education services. Um, our baseline is also uh, first semester last year. That's what we have to work with considering our situation these days. Um, strategies. So we are building upon the success of two strategies from a year ago. Um, we had Operation success, and these were part of our school improvement plan. That was for our academic goal. And then for our special education goal last year, we were instituting the ABR, or the Academic Behavior Resource. Our goal was to decrease um, special education suspensions by 10%. We decreased it by over 90%. So that was highly successful. So we decided we should blend that with Operation Success. So. Operation success is basically um, a reflection sheet where students are filling in from power school their, uh, their grades, their missing assignments, their truancies or absences, and then they set goals. And then they have a teacher that they work with. Well, now we're going to use that in ABR. So the students, special education students, when they go into the, there, they will get services and they will fill out that reflection sheet. And they will be able to talk about what's happening and they will be able to set goals and right then they will have a licensed teacher working with them one-on-one. -on -one. So we think that's a great plan um, and will help a lot with that um, you, um, to organize and to prioritize uh, their time. Um, so the Oh, and then we have a resource email system, so we have collaboration between gen ed teachers, uh, the ABR teacher, and the um, resource teachers. Roles and responsibilities, basically for administration, we will create, we will review, and we will monitor. 
Uh, the special education and general education teachers will execute support. So operation success this year, instead of being an activity schedule, is built into our homeroom advisory. So, and will also then be used in ABR. Um, and the student's job is just to get her done, do the work. Uh, so that last page for monitoring, administration will con conduct walkthroughs, we will review student submissions, and then we will run grade checks at the end of each quarter. There you have it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Please welcome Allison Lenzo from O'Bannon Elementary. This definitely won't be my last presentation. I'm not that close to retirement. Okay. <laughs> Good evening, Superintendent Miller, President Mamalan, board members. Um, I'm going to present to you about O'Bannon. And as you can see, our demographics, we had 491 students. Our largest population is our African-American population with 50%. And then our second largest is Hispanic at 32%. Um, our special education population is 14%. Our English learners, 6%, 6 and our free and reduced lunch is almost 77%. What stands out the most on this slide is our transiency rate. And if you remember last year, it was almost 30%. Uh -huh. um, we do, um, our building is near public housing, so we have a lot of students in and out all the time. So last year it was almost 30, so we were actually happy it was lower, but we are largest for the district. So our goal, our goal four is 5% of our um, IEP subgroup in grades three to five will pass the ELA section of iLearn. And you can see the percentages from the two previous years. Unfortunately, we don't have any of that data from last year. On the next slide, you can see our growth based off of NWEA for the mid-year test. Um, we did show progress from year to year, but we won't have that assessment to share for this year because we're switching over to exact path. So we'll start gathering new data because it's a different test that we'll be giving and then hopefully see that progression as well. So we were really happy when we presented this to you in February to see that growth. We were hoping to have our end of the year NWEA data, but we don't have that. So the strategies that we are going to be using um, with our students, so our K-1 to students will be really work, working on phonemic awareness and, and phonics lessons. Our second through fifth graders will be receiving repeated reading, and these are our students with IEPs. So it's a student who also may have speech services or a student who has a cognitive delay. So this is what they would be receiving. The special ed teachers will be giving an extra guided reading lesson three times a week to our IEP students, and our speech teacher helps with that as well. We would offer iLearn remediation this year, and we have exact path assessments. We have my virtual reading coach for our special ed population, as well as our general ed population for third to fifth grade. So that's another intervention that's really going to be beneficial to all of our students. And then the special ed department will be providing the reading aids program for us as well. So as you look over the roles and responsibilities, what's been really great, we started this last year, so our teachers collaborate weekly, but we never really spent time as a special ed group, so we really focused on meeting once a month as a special ed team. So myself, my case manager, and the special ed teachers, my assistant principal, sometimes our school psychologists can join us, so we meet the first Tuesday of the month to really look at our students and look at their data and what we need to change instructionally to help them progress. Um, our gen ed teachers also provide guided reading for all of our students, so they have that as well. And then they monitor the different computer programs that we have. Um, and then my assistant principal and myself, we do the observations and the walkthroughs. We're doing that virtually now with the teachers in, in their Google classrooms to see what they're working on. And we recently just trained our special ed aides on how to do the repeated reading, and they have their own Google classrooms, and they each have I think seven students, so they're also getting extra support right now virtually with the eights. So for monitoring, just kind of like everyone else, we would be doing the beginning, middle, and end of year assessments. Um, we would monitor those different computer programs monthly now that we have them up and running. Um, we would do those repeated reading assessments, phonics assessments, and then also look at our iLearn data once we have that. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Please welcome from Scott Middle School, Jeremy Hicks.
Good evening, Superintendent Miller, President Mamala, members of the board. I'm here representing Charles and Scott Middle School, our school improvement plan presentation for goal number four. Uh, I'd like to start off by just saying hello to everyone out there. Thank you for the support. And we're in this together. Uh, so here is our goal number four. So our demographics include um, uh, variations of and, and similar to the schools that presented. Uh, we have students of all abilities and demographics. Uh, most importantly, looking at our focus goal, our students that receive special education services are at about 18%, which include 144 um, present students. English language learners are 89 uh, students, which is 11%, and free and reduced is uh, close to 80%, which is 79.78. Our transiency rate is close to the state averages of 7%, and 2.4% uh, for inter and intra mobility. And if we look at our specific goal, um, by June of 2021, there will be a 5% decrease in the number of failing grades for our students who receive special education services as measured by student grade data in PowerSchool. So our data looks like out of 823 grades of students that had IEPs, 225 were failures, which is about 27%. And roles and responsibilities, as everyone has included, administration, instructional coaches, teachers, and teachers of record will really do the heavy lifting of it, but it, it's really everyone's responsibility within Scott Middle School uh, like to uh, see the success of this specific goal along with the three that were previously mentioned. Specific strategies, we're gonna have daily, weekly, monthly, and quarterly interventions and incentives. And then specific strategies will include professional development for all staff members to enhance understanding and support students that receive special education services. We're going to establish uh, tier two and tier three um, programs, a mentoring program or groups specifically for students that receive special education services, and we're going to develop a specific check-in system to collect and review data, which is absent as of today. So monitoring, um, again, going with the daily, weekly, and monthly, and quarterly, we're gonna make sure that we monitor PowerSchool and our student progress, and doing uh, provide our teachers of record the support that they definitely need, because uh, it's not gonna be them alone, it's gonna be us as a school working together to support our students. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. And for our final presentation of the evening from Wallace Elementary, Lori <coughs> Thursby. I feel like there should be like a run. Or yeah. Like <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Bobcats. Hello, Bobcats. We're so happy. <laughs> and special shout out to some of our Bobcats. Um, so good evening, Superintendent Miller, President Mamala, and School Board Trustees. I'm here to talk about Wallace and our plan, the fourth goal. Uh, before I do that, though, I want to uh, thank the district administration because them writing those three goals and us moving forward as a comprehensive uh, plan, I think, is really going to support um, everyone. So thank you to the team that did that. That was really a lot of work, and we appreciate it. And we know that attendance is going to be ours, but before I do that, let me talk about demographics. Um, for, those of you, for those of you who know our Wallace Bobcats, we're about 50-50. We've got 46% um, African American and about a little, almost 42% Hispanic. And then our white and multiracial are just about equal, right about 6%. Of those students, we've got um, about 13% that have IEPs. And our ELLs are at um, almost 21%. So we know that if students are not in school, they're not learning, and so our goal is attendance. So by the end of the school year, we wanna see an increase in our attendance by to 95%. Um, notice the progression, the decrease over the last few years of our attendance. We know that last year with COVID, that was in part the decrease, but um, we've been working hard on trying to get our students into the building, and so that's our comprehensive plan, is trying to get the kids in. Um, just so you know, our, our attendance so far is a little over 93%, so we're on an increase, which is great. All right. And to make this plan work, we need everyone's support. Oh, my strategies. Sorry. For some reason, my slides got a little out of order. Um, 
so the strategies that we have in place obviously is going to include everyone, but most importantly is tracking that attendance, and that's going to start with the teachers. They're going to be monitoring the attendance, and that's going to be reported to us. A big piece for us is our family connection, family workshops, and so we're going to get the parents involved and our outreach to support their needs. We know that students, we have to figure out the why. Why are they not coming to school? And so that's one of the focuses with our staff. We want to figure out our, um, the reasons that students are not participating. Is it a bullying issue? Is there something going on at home? Is there no engagement? So our attendance sort of supports the three goals that are going on with the district in that if they're not here, we can't do that. And then with our students, that are chronic absenteeism, that have chronic absenteeism, we want to do some um, contracts with them. So we want to make a connection with them on a personal level and with those families. And then for the students that are making improvements that are there for 100% and or showing improvement just with their daily attendance, we want to recognize those. We have few things already in place um, that obviously when we're in school help support them, but we've got also some things that we're doing virtually. We've started incentives for students um, that have, or classrooms that have the best weekly attendance and then the best monthly attendance, and we're doing virtual um, activities with those and recognizing them. So we've also got staff PD. There's going to be a, a three modules that they're going to be attending and looking at. So everyone's involved with this. It's not one person doing um, the whole thing. We've got the teachers who are the first ones that are monitoring and recording the attendance and sharing that out with us. Our office staff is involved. They'll do the daily monitoring and communicating with us. Myself and Ms. Hawkins, our assistant, we're overseeing it and we're also managing um, the PD that goes along with our um, staff. Uh, Ms. Austin, who is incredible, she's our family facilitator. She already has workshops planned. Um, we've done a couple of things with our families, and then our PTA is a huge piece also with um, getting all this done, and we want to thank them too for all that they're doing. And so the monitoring, we're going to be using the weekly attendance in um, PowerSchool. Uh, we want to make sure that our attendance stays at 94.6 or more, so we're slowly getting there. We want to see a decrease in the number of attendance, uh, or the decrease in the number of attendance calls, meaning those calls that the uh, staff is making, and then the letters that we're sending home, and then also we want to see an increase in the um, attendance rate for those students that are at risk. Just trying to keep it to five minutes to wrap it up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. At this point, we'd like to invite Mr. Tony Salinas back up to the podium for a wrap up. Thank you, Mrs. Danko, for that introduction. Uh, I'd like to also take this time to really just thank all of the principals. You guys did a fantastic job. We're very proud of you and very, very honored to lead you in this. So on behalf of the uh, curriculum team, uh, we, we do thank you. I'm just up here really quickly to talk a little bit about leadership, uh, about the fact that um, we as leaders here in this district are very, very proud of the fact that we have um, <clears throat> Scott Miller as our leader. Leadership is based on inspiration, not domination, on cooperation, not intimidation. The School City of Hammond administrative team has 100% faith in Mr. Miller's leadership and vision for our school district. He is completely supported by every administrator in this room. And we'd like to take this moment, we'd like to take this moment to say thank you for everything you do and to Acknowledge that this could not be done without your vision and everything that you do for us and you are appreciated and admired by your entire administrative team. So thank you very much. Thank you. I think. And with that, I think we are complete for the evening, believe it or not. Um, I'll turn it over to the board and Mr. Miller. Before, before we adjourn, I just want to also thank everyone. Um, this format for me uh, made it a lot easier to focus on what's, what's going to be happening uh, with each of the buildings. And you know, prior to this, it was like 19 schools with four goals each. That was a lot of goals and difficult for anybody to process. But to know that we have our three district goals, again, of the cultural competency, the MTSS, improving core instruction across all our buildings, that's going to allow us to 
to focus in on our resources and um, make sure we get what we need. And then each school being able to select what the area that they know that they need to focus on, uh, I think we're gonna be able to, to do it. Like I'm very excited about the, this direction and, and where we're headed. So um, trustees, uh, just a reminder, please go ahead and just email your, if you have any questions of the principals or any presentation, just go ahead and email them to me and I will get them to the principals um, and, and back to you. The answer is back to you. So thank you very much. That concludes all the presentations. Mm -hmm. And uh, Superintendent Miller, I want to thank you very much for all you do in your vision. I want to thank the leadership team, and I want to thank all of you out here. Thank you for all you do, and I'm so proud of every one of you, and I appreciate you very, very much. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Adjournment, calling for adjournment? So moved. Meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.